This video is meant to serve as a demonstration of how to incorporate the curriculum into your teaching demonstrations on the Anatomage table. Within the table curriculum folder on the desktop, you will see it is subdivided based on anatomical region. Additionally, there is a collection of PDFs that will facilitate your instruction using the curriculum. Begin by opening up the full curriculum file. The full curriculum guide will include all of the various sections of the body that have been labeled and annotated to correspond to the curriculum itself. As we can see, it's subdivided in the table of contents by the thorax, the upper limb, abdomen and pelvis, lower limb, and the head and neck. Each section will include an image displaying what the view would look like when loaded on the anatomosh table as well as a list of all of the labeled anatomical structures. This will give you an idea of how to guide and direct the students through your educational plan for that day's activities. You may either choose to display the curriculum PDF on the table itself and switch back and forth during your demonstration, or take advantage of displaying the PDF on an electronic device near the anatomosh table. Displaying the curriculum guide on an alternate electronic device will allow you to interact with the curriculum contents while maintaining contact with the anatomage table. This will allow you to recall the ideas you had prior to beginning the demonstration and the topics of discussion you wish to present to the students. Once you have selected a topic of interest, select the table 2.0 icon on the desktop. This will open up a main menu. From here, select the image library icon. The image library will contain a complete list of all of the cases subdivided based on anatomical region. In the lower left hand corner, we can see the curriculum icon. By selecting the curriculum icon, we can navigate to the desktop and find the table curriculum folder. Open the folder and identify the region of interest followed by the topic of interest. When the case opens, it will load with the default orientation and render setting. It is not necessary with the curriculum project to modify any of the controls at this time. Simply select the film strip on the left hand side of icons. The film strip icon will load what is known as the view sequencer. The view sequencer will contain a list of views meant to facilitate instruction within that region. By simply selecting on any of the views, we can begin our navigation through the view sequence. As we can see, the first list within the view sequence is labeled aortic arch branches, followed by arterial supply to the right side and arterial supply to the left side. Thus, thus we know what to expect as we begin our navigation through the provided views within this view sequence. Prior to an in-depth investigation of the vasculature of the head and neck, I'll often remind students of where these vessels originate. In this scan, we can see the arch of the aorta giving off the three main vessels ascending towards the neck. On the right-hand side, we see the brachiocephalic trunk, while on the left, we see the left common carotid and the left subclavian arteries. The arch of the aorta is located posterior to the manubrium. By pulling the cutting plane anteriorly, we can put back in place the manubrium and identify where the first rib articulates at the lateral aspect of this structure. By cutting back through the manubrium, we can again gain visualization of the aortic arch and see these three main vessels as they branch superiorly off of this great vessel. The second view in the list will lead us to the vasculature on the right hand side. Here again we can see the arch of the aorta giving off the brachiocephalic trunk which will split to the right common carotid artery and the right subclavian artery. As we switch the view to the arterial supply of the left side we see that difference that unlike the right which had the brachiocephalic trunk we now see the left common carotid artery and the left subclavian artery directly coming off the arch of the aorta. As on the right hand side, we can see the vertebral artery originating off of the subclavian artery on the left. As we continue moving superiorly, we will follow the left common carotid artery and see its bifurcation near the carotid sinus 
to the internal and external carotid arteries. The internal carotid artery is located more posteriorly and will ascend to give blood supply to the brain. As we can see, no branches are external to the skull off the internal carotid artery. This differs from the external carotid artery, which will give blood supply to the face and the neck. Again, we've highlighted the presence of the subclavian artery along with the vertebral artery to emphasize the various origins of these big vessels originating and coming up towards the head and neck. Similarly, the right common carotid, after it comes off the brachiocephalic trunk, will ascend and bifurcate near the level of the hyoid bone into the internal and external carotid arteries. Again, we can see more posteriorly located the vertebral artery ascending in the transverse foramen of the cervical vertebrae. As we can see in the view sequence, we are now shifting from the titles beginning with number one to the titles beginning with number two. On the curriculum guide, we see that number two focuses on the external carotid artery. Thus, all of the sequences listed beginning with number two, I will expect to be associated with the external carotid artery. As we know, the external carotid artery will give blood supply to the face and the neck. The external carotid artery is located anterior to the internal carotid artery and branches off of the common carotid artery. The first branch we will investigate off of the external carotid artery descends inferiorly towards the thyroid gland. Here we can see a faint outline of the superior thyroid artery as it descends towards the lateral lobe of the thyroid. It is indicated in the list that this is a vessel with low visibility. Each data set as it comes in will have better visibility of certain structures than others. Here, although we can see the superior thyroid artery, it appears quite faint in relation to some of the other large vessels. As we move superiorly, we can see the external carotid artery in a branch curling up towards the inferior aspect of the face. We can see the lingual artery originating both on the right and left hand sides of the patient and its relative relationship to the hyoid bone. The lingual artery will difference from its appearance to the facial artery as it ascends medial and deep to the mandible, whereas the facial artery will curl superficially and come towards the face lateral to the mandible. In this view, we can additionally see where the body of the mandible would be, as well as the angle of the mandible, and their approximate relationship to the branching of the external carotid artery. As we continue moving superiorly, the next branch off the external carotid artery, after superior thyroid, lingual, and facial, is the maxillary. Now the maxillary artery will course deep to the mandible, and is often best visualized by cutting back and forth through the viewing plane to follow the path of this vessel deep to the ramus of the mandible. It isn't possible to see the entire scope of the maxillary artery without manipulating the data to some degree. Thus, we can cut back and forth to show that the maxillary artery is a branch off of the external carotid and will run anteriorly towards the face. Again, most of these vessels are listed as low visibility simply because they're a little more difficult to see. As we continue moving superiorly, the external carotid artery will give off a branch anterior to the external acoustic meatus. This vessel is known as the superficial temporal artery. By adjusting the render settings, we can actually increase the viewing visibility of some of these structures and see the relationship of this vessel coursing anterior to the external ear. The occipital artery is actually quite visible in this patient. We can see that it courses posterior deep to the mastoid process and will come up on the posterior aspect of the skull near the occipital bone for which it is named. Although this is a vessel giving blood supply to the back of the head 
it does originate in the neck off of the external carotid artery, which we can see here. As we turn back to the curriculum guide, we can note two bullet points highlighting specific anatomy that could be mentioned in this demonstration. For example, we have now identified the external carotid artery with its branches to the face and neck. Additionally, we can highlight the two terminal branches from the external carotid artery. The terminal branches off the external carotid artery would be the superficial temporal and the maxillary. Thus, as we change the cutting plane, we can see the superficial temporal as well as the maxillary artery and can define this point as the approximate termination of the external carotid artery. Once we have finished with our discussion of the external carotid artery, we then move on to the internal carotid artery with 3A. Here we see the internal carotid artery as viewed from the left hand side. We note that the internal carotid artery is located posterior to the external carotid artery as seen from the opposite side. At any point, the orientation can be changed or rotated to facilitate student comprehension of what they're seeing. The internal carotid artery will arise from the carotid sinus. At this point, it could be mentioned that this is an important structure for both chemo and baroreception. Thus, identifying the oxygen content and the chemical makeup of the blood prior to reaching the brain. The next view in the sequence gives us an inferior view zoomed in of the carotid canal. It may be useful to zoom back out and allow students to orient themselves by identification of the zygomatic arch or potentially the ramus of the mandible. Here, we can also see the mastoid process and the external acoustic meatus. By zooming back in, we see the proximity of the internal carotid artery to the internal jugular vein. The internal carotid artery will ascend into the skull through the opening of the carotid canal. 3C gives us a view of the carotid canal as seen inferiorly with an axial slice through the skull we can see that the internal carotid artery will course medially through the temporal bone and ascend near the location of foramen lacerum. It may be useful to point out that although this is a quite large foramen in the base of the skull, it doesn't actually transmit any structures. To clarify this point, you may find it useful to scroll up and down through the data set to better visualize the body of the sphenoid the internal carotid artery and its course running superiorly through the carotid canal but not passing through foramen lacerum. On this side, we can see the same structures without the obstruction of the labels. We will then continue with the discussion that the anterior blood supply to the brain is actually provided by the internal carotid artery. This is a coronal plane as seen posteriorly to allow us visualization of the carotid arteries on either side of cella tersica in the cavernous sinus. The carotid artery will curl and then give off the middle and anterior cerebral arteries. This perspective also gives us a great opportunity to discuss a clinical case with the students. We see an aneurysm clamp on the middle cerebral artery. By rotating the skull to the side, we can see the hole cut in the surface of the skull as well as clamps put in place to hold the bone back in after this procedure was performed. A discussion of placement of aneurysm clamps as well as a purpose to stem the blood in different types of aneurysms may be very effective with this specific case. The alternate blood supply to the brain is covered in the fourth section within this view sequence. Here we see the vertebral artery after having removed all of the structures located anteriorly. By putting back in some of the more superficial structures, we can see the depth of the vertebral artery in relationship to the structures both found superficially and more deeply in the neck. The vertebral artery will course superiorly off of the subclavian arteries on both the right and left hand sides. 
often we'll see that it skips C7 and will not pass through the transverse foramen at this level. Rather, it begins its ascent in the transverse foramen at the level of C6. Here we see a view of the left vertebral artery coursing past C7, which we can identify with the vertebra prominence, and ascending superiorly towards the skull. The vertebral artery is unique and it has various portions defined based on its path and where it is in close proximity to other structures. Here we can see the vertebral portion coursing superiorly through the transverse foramen. As we get near the base of the skull, the vessel will cut medially and ascend through foramen magnum as the suboccipital portion of the vertebral artery. As the vertebral artery continues with the suboccipital portion between C1 and the base of the skull, the two vessels now are called the cranial portion. The cranial portion of the vertebral artery will fuse as the basilar artery, a midline vessel ascending towards the circle of Willis. Here, from a superior perspective looking down into the top of the skull at the cranial base, we can see the cranial portions of the vertebral artery clearly forming the basilar artery. Additionally, we can see some of the branches coming off of these vessels to the brain itself. We can actually see small vessels coming to the cerebellum directly off of the vertebral artery. These would be the inferior cerebellar arteries, as well as the superior cerebellar artery faintly seen inferior to the posterior cerebral artery. The basilar artery will terminate as the posterior cerebral artery just after giving off the superior cerebellar arteries. The last view that we have in this view sequence is a superior view of the circle of Willis. We now can talk about the posterior blood supply of the brain communicating with the anterior blood supply of the brain. Here we see the basilar artery terminating as the posterior cerebral arteries. We can see the internal carotid artery giving rise to the anterior and middle cerebral arteries. Additionally, we can see small communication between the right and left anterior cerebral arteries as the anterior communicating artery, as well as the small vessel coming posteriorly to join the anterior and posterior blood supplies of the brain. This key vessel is the posterior communicating artery. The posterior communicating artery, although faint, is visible and can be explained as the key communication between the anterior and posterior blood supplies of the brain. After having completed the demonstration of the arterial supply to the head and neck, you could continue the discussion by talking about the venous drainage. To do so, we will again select from the power icon the image library, scroll, select the curriculum file, and now move on to number four, venous drainage of the head and neck. With the venous drainage for the head and neck, a new case will be displayed. Again, select the film icon to begin playing the view sequence. Hopefully you have seen how the curriculum guide can be used to give an effective demonstration on the anatomage table. The more you use the curriculum guide, you will become more familiar with the features of the table and be able to give more and more effective presentations.